So the technologies that we, we uh, see in the uh, Harappan world. And uh, the, the construction, of course, does happen as soon as people settle down. Very simple, crude uh, uh, dwellings, often uh, uh, called pit dwellings. The simplest possible dwelling is just dig a hole in the ground and have some poles, po wooden posts outside and thatch that. And you will be, of course, if you have taken care of the runoff water, uh, you will be sheltered easily. So you don't actually construct anything except a roof. Then later on, all kinds of daub and wattle and uh, rubble walls and so on are, uh, uh, come along. Now for more sophisticated construction technology, we have to turn to the Harappans, where <coughs> you see here these um, uh, uh, bricks, which are actually a major Harappan uh, invention in the sense that, looking for my laser pointer, but it doesn't matter, uh, in the sense that uh, they will, they, will, they chose those bricks which had proportions of one to two to four. The, the width is twice the uh, thickness and the um, uh, length is twice the width. Now this allows you to have alternating uh, uh, layers uh, of bricks lengthwise and widthwise, which is exactly what you can see here. You see, if you, if you see those bricks, these are lengthwise, and below they will be widthwise. So this is called in masonry the English bond, and it is uh, one of the bonds that give you the best structural strength with the minimum amount of material. If you have very flattish or squarish <coughs> bricks, as you will find later on in the Ganges Valley, you have to have very thick walls to compensate. You can't have thin walls. They will not have any cohesion. So this is what the Harappans discovered. These are one of their you know, many discrete uh, discoveries uh, which made them technologically so good. You've recognized, of course, the Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro. And this Great Bath uh, contained water by uh, waterproofing uh, this uh, bottom. And uh, this was done by keeping the bricks uh, on edge, not flat, but on edge. Uh, these were very, very finely worked bricks, and like the rest, I mean, they are all fine, but they are, they, those were exceptional. And the gaps between the bricks were reduced, was reduced to the barest minimum, uh, which was usually one, one millimeter or so. And over this, they laid a layer of gypsum plaster. Gypsum plaster is a kind of a, uh, something between plaster of Paris and cement, but it's a no, naturally occurring, uh, of course, mineral. And uh, even over that, they laid a level of bitumen. Bitumen is a natural tar, and they would get it from natural sources in uh, Baluchistan, which was not far away. So therefore, they were able to waterproof. So these uh, techniques were well understood and well practiced. And well, I can't uh, go much further into, into the topic. Of course, the Harappans constructed a huge number of houses, residences that were sometimes one or two or three stories high. Uh, but we don't have too many details uh, about the upper stories, unfortunately. <coughs> um, transport technology, uh, you cannot have a civilization like the Harappan uh, with some uh, good transportation because you need to communicate. You see, civilization is about communication. And uh, about uh, you cannot have a civilization without uh, trade networks, for example. So in the hinterland, the Harappans were, of course, using uh, bullock carts. Like these, uh, this is a toy cart. You can see this is just uh, 10 centimeters. And uh, they made a lot of toy carts, uh, toy cart models for their children. And, and in fact, interestingly, 40, 50 years ago in Pakistan, they were using still almost identical bullock carts. There was very little difference. Uh, even the width between the two wheels was measured at Harappa because grooves were found uh, in uh, uh, parts lined with uh, bricks. And the width happened to be exactly the same as the width some archaeologists did some work, which was still used in Pakistan some decades ago. So, you know, things are sometimes very conservative in uh, the subcontinent. Um, what uh, uh, we do not know for sure is whether the, the wheels were always full, like this one, 
then it, they would be probably ways of uh, either stone, but they have not been found, or more likely wood, because they would be lighter. Or did they have also sometimes wheel, wheels with spokes, like these two small terracotta models seem to indicate? Uh, this is uh, something uh, hotly debated, because normally spoked wheels are supposed to have been invented somewhere in Central Asia and not in India. So unfortunately, you know, wood is not preserved in, in the archaeological record in the Northwest. So, so far, no, no such wheel has been actually found. So the question remains open. Now, for long distance trade, you need more than bullocks, and shipping was the answer. And not only long distance, even internal trade within the Indus civilization required, uh, you know, we find, for example, I mentioned maybe earlier here, that uh, you have uh, st uh, stone st segments of pillars, segments of pillars which are manufactured in Dholavira and they are shipped all the way to Harappa, which is in Punjab. Mohanjodaro has them, Harappa has them. And they are all made in Dholavira. This has been proved recently. So, so therefore, this will be river communication through the Indus. And uh, you see here on top, there are two, three terracotta uh, tablets like this one. You see an example of uh, a river boat. A river boat because the bottom is very flat. You cannot use such a flat bottom boat on the sea. Uh, it will, you will need uh, something different. And we don't have models, unfortunately. Uh, but um, uh, this is the kind of boats they were manufacturing. Where did they manufacture them? How? These are questions we, we, we just cannot answer. But the technology existed. And uh, the, this famous dockyard in Lothal is also a, a, an ev some evidence of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, structures related to um, ship-based trade. So, so this technology existed, but the one major technology which uh, the Harappans distinguish themselves in is uh, metallurgy, copper bronze metallurgy. We are in the Bronze Age. Iron Age will be much later. Iron Age is the age of the Gangetic civilization here, that is first millennium BC. Though I will give you the dates in a moment. Here we find all these uh, uh, copper or bronze tools like uh, these uh, spearheads, which are largely ceremonial. They are not good for, uh, for, for warfare. They would uh, buckle upon Im impact. These are the chisels which are used to chop stones, for example. This is from Mohenjo-daro, very modern looking kind of a double head, double headed axe, which is a very good tool. Uh, but the, 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 the first evidence is 6000 BC, but this is a, just a small bead. So nothing much can be made uh, of it. And uh, then by 4,500, the metallurgy develops in right earnest in the Northwest. And, <clears throat> and uh, uh, bronze, you see, is a soft metal. But uh, so how were they able to have such chisels which, with which you could actually chop a stone, uh, dress it, cut it, and so on? because they understood how to harden bronze by addition of some components like typically uh, uh, arsenic or nickel. These are the two harsen, uh, hardening substances. Uh, the question is whether they were actually doing it empirically by selecting certain ores which they knew gave a harder metal, or whether adding those metals uh, in, the, uh, allo in the alloying phase uh, all this is still not fully understood. In fact, uh, we are at present conducting some tests on copper samples in IIT Gandhi Nagar, but the tests are actually conducted here with the metallurgist friends uh, here in IIT Kampo. And uh, <clears throat> we hope one day that we will be able to, uh, there have been lots of tests done already before, but we, we don't have still firm answers to these questions. These are more examples of uh, beautiful uh, massive tools from Dolavira on the right. Uh, this is actually the scale is, uh, um, this will be, I think by, this should be 10 to 20, 30, 40, 40 centimeter. You can see the size of this chisel. It's enormous. And uh, on top you have arrowheads for hunting, used for hunting. 
Um, so the industry is very well, uh, uh, very well developed by now. You have lots of pots and a few figurines, not too many because the Harappans are very pragmatic people. And uh, copper bronze is still a fairly rare uh, material or costly, demands a lot of labor. And uh, they don't obviously want to, to, you know, put too much of it in statues. But still, a few, like this famous dancing girl uh, found in Mohenjo-daro, made of bronze. And uh, <clears throat> interestingly, the whole of the left arm is covered with uh, bangles, and, uh, which is uh, a tradition still in vogue in rural parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Uh, uh, in fact, one photo I showed earlier of um, Dholavira, the entrance to the castle in some other lecture, uh, uh, there was a, a worker who, who happened to have exactly the same kind of uh, fully co uh, covered arm. Anyhow, the question here is the technology and how do they do such statues? Now, you cannot really, you cannot uh, chip a bronze the way you chip stone. So you can't do it the same, you have to cast it. And this is the technique known as lost wax technique, where you first make a, um, a small uh, model in wax, and uh, you surrounded it with a special kind of clay, which will, um, uh, you know, which will not crack when you heat it. So you then you heat the whole thing at high temperature. Your clay hardens. You've of course given a hole that the wax can flow out of, and <clears throat> then. Then what you do is that you bury this mold uh, in the ground, uh, upside down, you bury it, and you can pour your molten bronze into it. So this is known as the lost wax, or sometimes cire perdu, uh, that's after the French uh, phrase. And um, uh, the, this is worth mentioning because this technique will not die in India ever. It will be transmitted to the Ganges and it will be used by all bronze casters in India, and even today, traditional bronze casters. There are communities that keep making those statues, craftsmen, basically. They are using the very same Harappan technique. So this is uh, one uh, hypothesis that they were getting uh, some of their <coughs> copper from the Aravali. This is Khetri, you know, the Khetri mines are still being used today. <clears throat> but we don't know for sure, and we hope that the tests we are started after a few years will be able to answer whether they were taking from the Aravalis, whether they were importing copper from Oman, which is very rich in copper, in exchange of their own exports. Uh, we, we, can't, uh, we can't answer this for sure. This is the continuation of the bronze metallurgy in later uh, phases. This is now uh, in the historical time, about 500 uh, CE or AD, and uh, this is, uh, of course, on a totally different scale by now because uh, uh, things have moved quite a, a bit, and uh, people are able to do a lot of uh, uh, magnificent statues like this one, which measures 2.3 meters in high, in height. It weighs about 500 kilos. And so there's uh, there's uh, here obviously no depth of of the metal, and you see the refinement of the of the craftsmanship. You know how you can create this uh, uh, waving, wavery effect of the cloth of the Buddha. So magnificent statue which you can uh, admire if you visit Birmingham, uh, because this is one of the many <laughs> pieces that uh, you know the British helped themselves with. So of course you are aware of those uh, traditions. I won't spend time on this, but, but this is the same Harappan technique which is used to cast those huge, beautiful Nataraja statues. And um, even today, there are still, this is Aramulla in Kerala, uh, where there is a community of craftsmen producing mirrors uh, made of bronze. Of course, it's a slightly special alloy, which they highly polish, and you can use them as a mirror. And interestingly, the Harappans also had mirrors of bronze, because glass did not exist in Harappan times. And they were using uh, bronze, which they would polish very highly, and uh, they, they were not as artistically made as this. They were just uh, uh, discs uh, of bronze, which were probably they fixed a wooden handle or something. Uh, but this is also how they, they, they used to, uh, well, look at themselves.